Ambassador Gunnarsson, thank you. And for those of you who have not had a chance to deal with <coughs> Iceland's president before and Iceland's foreign ministry, you should know that I, have, I know no other country in the world that punches so far above its weight. And uh, if there's any one secret about the history of Arctic cooperation is find yourself uh, a man named Grimson. Oh, you already have who has done so much to bring us together. And thank you. I uh, wanted to, to uh, build upon what you've just heard in terms of uh, not only uh, the Arctic, but uh, also the, uh, the economics in the earlier slide. But I'm going to start out uh, hundreds of miles or uh, uh, north of Alaska. And that is a very big nuclear submarine I got to ride on, and it, it had just come up through the ice. Uh, and we were doing uh, uh, studies uh, uh, there on strategic issues. That was 2011. But everything you heard today about the albedo effect of Arctic sea ice is very, very important, very important science. Uh, the freshening of the Arctic Ocean is another very interesting thing. Uh, as the land gets warmer, we are, we are sending more water out into the ocean. So the composition of the Arctic Ocean is changing. Uh, and that also is happening in the Himalayas. Um, we have uh, the sea level rise and lots of erosion, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but uh, the Arctic is basically an area without the kind of precipitation that you've seen building the glaciers in the Himalayas. And we're, re we're effectively a desert. And uh, so the, the melting is taking away a lot of water that we might otherwise be using as processed water. Um, you had the, uh, the bankers, uh, uh, my, my colleagues in my economic hat, uh, talk about six things we do. I like to say we feed the world with our fish, we fuel the world with our energy, we provide the world with our minerals, we protect the world, and I'll talk about that just a second, when we connect the world, and with our tourism, we inspire the world. Where we protect the world is not just the military bases in Keflavik and Thule uh, that you heard about today. It's also the magnetic poles of the Earth uh, shield us from solar radiation, and without that, life on Earth would be impossible. We uh, collect a small royalty from that by selling postcards of the Aurora Borealis. Uh, we also uh, protect the world with the albedo of the sea ice and, and quite a bit of cold uh, uh, moderation of the Earth's climate, and that's, that's something important to us. We have indigenous people, we have huge multi-diversity, we have probably the best laboratory for alternative energy. Many of the things that you're seeing down the exhibit halls, down, down the road, uh, we, because our cost of power is higher in places like Alaska, we are the first test for some of these kinds of uh, new technologies, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we have large uh, facilities. Most of these modules in Yamal, that's uh, the Russian gas export, were brought via the Northern Sea Route. Uh, and we have, as you can see there, changes with tourism, changes with sloughing with, uh, 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 with all of that, and uh, with, the, with the warming climate. And we're, we're very, very concerned about these changes. And so we're standing with you in the Himalayas and looking for solutions. Um, just a quick refresher, the ambassador uh, did a very good job. There are eight of us in the Arctic. Uh, Russia, Canada, the United States is an Arctic nation because of Alaska. Denmark is an Arctic nation because of Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Iceland. And uh, the fact that this group came together, and I also want to emphasize what the ambassador said about working with the locals. It was a, a, a precursor. There were two precursors to the Arctic Council that I think are very important to be aware of. One, we had, uh, uh, we had the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, which was a Finnish initiative, which created the working groups that are now the working groups of the Arctic Council. We had another group, which was Arctic Governors, uh, uh, which they came together as the Northern Forum, and it still exists. And frankly, the, sh the rift with Russia has been a big challenge for the Northern Forum because I've served with governors who don't want to meet their Russian counterparts. Uh, and yet, if we don't talk as neighbors, no matter what the geopolitical problems are, you don't solve the problems, and the, uh, the local problems. And I think that's very, very important. 
Why do we cooperate in the Arctic? It was the opening of Russia. I went first across the Russian Arctic in 1981 with uh, former Governor Wally Hickel, who had done an Arctic trip across North America with, uh, uh, when, when he and Jean, uh, Jean Chrétien had been serving together as ministers in the late 60s, early 70s. But we saw this as one way to help bring Russia into the family of nations, promote peace, set norms for a new ocean. How many times in the world do you get a new ocean? Well, I'll say this about the Himalayas, whether or not the Silk Road actually ever happens, the connection uh, in the 21st century, the connection of places in the world we've dreamed of connecting uh, in, in global commerce uh, over the last thousand years will probably happen. And it was this, the, it was uh, setting norms for a new ocean was important. Responding to climate change is very important. Economics, uh, you, uh, we, the trillion dollars that Scott Minard has talked about, uh, we don't have that capital stuffed in our mattresses in the Arctic. And I don't think you have it in the Himalayas either. Investment requires stability and global understanding. And the political discussions have done more to foster investment than the political leaders realize. Finally, there were cultural and personal connections. And I say this all the time, Catherine, uh, as you look at uh, the Ted Stevens Center and soft power, there is a huge buildup of Russians who live in Alaska uh, because during this opening time from the Cold War till now, uh, people got together, had families, uh, same connections in Norway, and we have to look at that. I'm gonna leave with just a couple of quick slides on, on things, the eight Arctic states, there are six permanent participants, six working groups, we'll talk about that, and 38 observers. And uh, I was proud to be sent by the United States to help c convince Japan to come in as an observer. It's very, very important that the regions that use your region or affect your region with, say, things like black carbon output are there as observers in the Arctic Council. Uh, the seat at the table, you have uh, the thing to know about the six observers is that except for the Russian group, all of those observer groups are binational to begin with. We drew political borders, and we heard this, uh, uh, we heard this earlier today about the Himalayas. Uh, uh, we drew political borders, but it's important that these families and these indigenous folks uh, cross the borders. The 38 observers, there's all sorts of rules about the observership, but one thing I say is a good rule is that to be an observer at the Arctic Council, especially a state observer, we've asked them to keep doing work with our people. That's fostered investment in our communities. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, as President Grimson talked about globalization before, I don't think we would have had certain Chinese or Singaporean investment in Arctic issues had it not been for them wanting to show that they were doing work with the Arctic Council. Uh, we have the Arctic Council working groups which began with this, and, and I will just tell you the significance of not just the reports and the action from the reports uh, is, is clear. And as the ambassador said, I'll just tell you one story, there's a million of them. The Arctic Council is a movable feast. Many of us have been dining together in different parts of the world now for 20, 30 years. Uh, we, we had a, a problem at the end of the climate impact assessment that the ambassador spoke about because the United States did not want the Arctic tail to wag the global dog and said, who are these eight Arctic nations trying to, trying to fit climate policy? That sent me as a leader for US government on Arctic issues into the back of a very smoky bar in Sweden to convince Sweden to change the, uh, in its chairmanship how we came out of the climate impact assessment to make it far more supporting of research than trying to redo, uh, uh, at that point, Kyoto. And uh, we, we were able to be successful. And I have to say that the level of trust that you build up in these groups is incredibly important. We've gotten three major agreements out of this. Uh, you can look at the slides later. Uh, the, and uh, then we've also done a non-Arctic Council treaty in terms of high seas fishing in the north. All because we had the dialogue and people activated who knew each other in the different governments. I remember going to China at one point and wanting to meet people in China who were interested in the Arctic. And the US Embassy said, Governor, we don't know who to talk to. I called my friend at the Icelandic Embassy who had been a, 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 one of the senior Arctic officials before, and he put together the meeting. 
And the fact that you have this small group has been very, very helpful to move those things along. I want to conclude just by saying, and the next panel uh, after, after our panel today is about NGOs. And I feel very proud of the fact, not only what have we accomplished in the government side, but these are just uh, institutes that we've worked with. The Ted Stevens one is probably the newest uh, of groups. Uh, the, uh, uh, the work that was mentioned about Scott Minard, uh, we worked on at the Hoover Institution of the World uh, Economic Forum before we got PT Capital and these other major investment entities started. And if you don't have the NGOs tracking this, I will tell you, we went very quickly from an Arctic environmental protection strategy that we could have had the meeting on this stage, it was very small with eight nations, to something where you couldn't fit it in the main, uh, the main room of this, uh, of this auditorium. And if it weren't for NGOs like this, doing the track two, doing the what if, asking the questions about glass beads, uh, it would never move forward to government activity. So what we're doing here is very, very much a part of the Arctic Council process, and that's my main takeaway, is don't leave your governments alone. Keep working outside to improve what happens inside. Thank you.